Good morning. I'd just like to remind you that we at North Orange Christian Church have a culture of children in the service, and it's okay. Um, I can preach uh, through the, the crying, so you guys um, just bear with us as we uh, love young families together. In the summer of 2022, right about the time all this pandemic shutdown stuff was uh, finishing up, my father surprised my family, um, my wife and uh, three kids, and he said, um, I want to take you guys, and with, you know, grandma, his wife, um, we're all going to go on a Disney cruise together this summer, um, and it'll be one to the Bahamas, and um, so we'll fly out of Miami, and I mean, we'll fly to Miami, we'll sail out of Miami, and we'll go on a Disney cruise together. And I said to him, Dad, that's, that's really expensive. Don't spend your money on us like that. And he said, um, don't tell me how to spend my money. <laughs> I'm your dad, you're not my dad. And that's that. And I said, all right, the old man still got some fight in him, okay. So I said, all right, we're going on a cruise. And um, the cruise was one of the best weeks of my children and my wife's lives. I've, I've talked about it a lot. It was just a great, great time. When we got there and we saw my father, who had been suffering from cancer for some seven years now, he was a little more sick than he had let on. Um, but he was still grandpa. I took the kids shopping, took the kids around and stuff. And uh, again, one of the best weeks of our lives. We, we stayed back, my family in Miami afterwards to do the zoo and some sites in Miami. My father flew back to San Francisco with his wife. And um, I found out that when he reached San Francisco, he had passed away. And so for me and my kids, we were, we were gripped with this reality that we just had one of the best weeks of our lives and we were instantly hit in the face with this extreme grief. And it's like, what do we do with that? How do we process this? Abraham in the Bible, when he was 75 years old, God called him from his homeland of Ur. He left with his wife, Sarah. Together, they adventured for 40 years on God's adventure. They had victories together. The promise of God through specific, special covenant with the living God. God changed their name. God changed their future. They experienced a miracle when the childless, unable to have children, Sarah had a miracle child named Isaac. They experienced great prosperity as they were a wealthy family nomads in the land, never owning any of the land that they lived. They failed a couple of times too. There was at least two times when Abraham pretended that his wife was his sister to spare his own hide. Right? There was that one time that Abraham had an illegitimate child because, you know, they wanted to speed up God's plan and force God's hand. They failed a couple of times. But they were blessed people living under the covenant of God. And that's where we are in Genesis 23 this morning. Turn with me to Genesis 23 and I'll, I'll allow you some time to get there. Genesis 23 says this. Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died at Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. So the question is asked, what do you do when a loved one dies? What do we as God-fearing children of the Lord do when a loved one dies? With a church this size, people following online, with the last four years of turmoil and pandemic, I can guarantee you that there are people who have suffered the grief of a loved one dying. Some of you have had to officiate the funerals of your loved ones, so I know. What do you do when a loved one dies? The first thing we see here from Abraham is it is normal to experience great pain. It's normal 
to experience heartbreaking pain. When a loved one dies, it's like part of you dies. Verse two, Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. The word mourn in the Hebrew means to wail out, to tear at the heart, to beat at the chest. This was not a man who was suffering in silence. He was processing his emotions outwardly. He was broken and he wept for her. If your loved one dies, a spouse, a parent, a child, it's completely normal to suffer a broken heart. Don't think you're weak. Don't think it's abnormal. It's completely normal. Doctors say there are five stages of grief. Some doctors say there are seven stages of grief, but I'm gonna give you five stages of grief here really quickly and, and just so you can have them just in case you're in the grieving stages or have to go through them at some point. Stage one is denial. It's not happening. This didn't happen. Stage two is anger, possibly at God. Stage three is bargaining. I'll do this if this. Stage four is depression. It's the utter sadness. And stage five is acceptance. Tell you all that to tell you that this, everyone grieves death. And nobody does it in that order, okay? Those are steps that people go through, and they go through them in different orders, but those are the stages of grief. Even Abraham, the patriarch, had to experience deep grief. If he had to experience it, everyone will. So here's some, here's some tips if you're grieving. Okay, how do, we, how do we grieve when someone dies? Here's some tips. Number one, not everyone grieves the same. If you're living in a house with someone and you both experience the death, don't look over to them in, in six months and go, why aren't you crying? I'm still crying. You didn't love like I loved, right? That's unfair to them. Okay, Not everyone processes grief the same. And not everyone grieves at the same pace. right? Like I said, they might have already grieved. They might grieve for two to five years. You might be done in a month. In Hebrew tradition, it's still a tradition today. It would be um, in Deuteronomy, or maybe possibly later. If a parent died, you wore black for a year to show that you were grieving. A year. Nowadays, in our society, you get a couple days off and we want you back to work on Monday, right? We don't really embrace the truth of grief, but everyone grieves at a different pace. Everyone grieves death. You can't run from it. I guarantee you, it'll leak out somewhere else, right? That's why we have a society that is unable to have parameters on their emotions, You'd be driving next to somebody and they're honking, telling you you're number one with a different finger. And you're like, well, what's the matter with you? Right? There's so many things going on in their life. Maybe they're running from grief. Here's the second thing. You can't force grief. You can't, oh, I got this thing coming up. I got six months to grieve. I better get through it. And so you're checking things off on the list. All right, did I already bargain? Did I already deny? Did... No, it's got to happen at its own time. So grief is real. And every human experiences it. And Abraham experienced it. Jesus experienced it at the death of Lazarus. You will experience grief. So let it happen. Go through the process. In this story, Abraham is grieving the death of his beloved wife. What does he do now? Genesis 23. He talks to the people around him who have come around him out of respect because they know that Sarah has just died. He says this. I'm a sojourner, I'm a traveler, I'm a nomad, and a foreigner among you. Give me property among you for, for a burying place that I may bury my dead out of sight. The Hittites answered Abraham, hear us, my Lord. You are a prince of God among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our tombs. None of us will withhold from you his tomb to hinder you from burying your dead. Abraham rose and bowed to the people, the Hittites, and he said to them, if you're willing, I should bury my dead out of my sight. Hear me and entreat me, Ephron, the son of Zohar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he owns. 
It's at the end of this field. For the full price, let him give it to me in your presence as a property for a burying place. Abraham and Sarah were greatly wealthy as they, as they were a nomadic people, yet they never owned land. They only ever leased the land. And so this is the first time they would own something and it would be a burial plot. And at this time, the graves were sepulchers, which were caves in mountains that you could roll something in front of or burying them in, in a cave, like, like Jesus' tomb. And so Abraham says, the first thing that I will buy is somebody's cave. And they go, just bury them anywhere. But Abraham says, I need to own this. This is going to be a family plot. I need to own it. Here's Ephron's response, the one who owns it. No, my Lord, hear me. I give you the field, and I give you the cave that is in it. In the sight of the sons of my people, I give it to you. Bury your dead. We don't know what's happening here. It's pretty possible that the culture mandated he say something like that to someone who's grieving. Maybe if someone has died and um, in your life, someone is blessing you with something. Like, no, no, I got this. And okay, thank you. Thanks for that. But here's what you must do while you grieve. What we see with Abraham in this section is you must act with honor while you grieve. Though you are hurting, act in a way that will please the living God. See what Abraham says. Abraham bowed down before the people, verse 12 and 13 said to Ephron, in the hearing of the people in the land, if you will hear me, I give you the price of the field. Accept it from me that I may bury my dead there. He bows down respectfully. He's grieving, showing honor and respect to the people. and says, no, no, I can't take it. I can't take it for free. I'm going to pay you full price, and I'm not even going to negotiate the price of the field. And I want everyone here to know that. Acting with honor and dignity at the death of his beloved wife. You guys see that? Uh, 23, 16, Abraham listened to Ephron. Abraham weighed out for Ephron the silver that he had named in the hearing of the Hittites, 400 shekels of silver according to the weights current among the merchants. The field and the cave that is in it were made over to Abraham as a property for a burying place. So what do you do when a loved one dies? It's normal to experience great pain and you act with honor while you grieve. No no rash decisions, right? No unhealthy behaviors while you're grieving. No toxic behaviors. You're not getting wasted and binging and doing all those kinds of things. You will act with honor while you grieve. And that's what Abraham did here, though his heart was broken for his longtime wife. Which leads us to the second question What do you do after the funeral? Because a lot of times we can get to the funeral, but after that there's some finality to it. And so he's buried his bride in the cave. What do you do afterwards? And we see here next that you continue with the plan. Continue with the mission. Was your plan to raise your children into adulthood and then launch them? Continue with the plan. Was your plan to invent life-changing technology, AI, continue with the plan? Was your plan to become a medical doctor and save lives, continue with the plan? You honor the dead when you continue the mission. It honors them when you continue the mission. And this, continuing with purpose will help you in the healing process. When you continue with purpose, it helps you heal. It's not a disrespect to them. So what was Abraham and Sarah's plan? What was their plan? God had given it to them. Abraham was to be the father of many nations. Now to have, be the father of many nations, you need a mother, right? And so Sarah was the mother of many nations. Wasn't gonna happen for a while because they didn't have a kid. Now they had a kid, Isaac. Now, what has to happen for Isaac to be the parent of many nations? He needs a family. So to continue the plan, Abraham's got a plan for Isaac's family. So that's where we are now. Genesis 24. Abraham was old, well advanced in years. He was about 140 years old at this point. 
The Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, remember this could have been Eleazar, he's unnamed, the servant, the eldest of his household who had charge over all the land. This is the top person working under him. He says this, put your hand under my thigh that I may make you swear by the Lord of the God of heaven, the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell, but will go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son Isaac. He gets his, his uh, most trusted servant in the house, number one employee, and he says this, it's time for Isaac to get a wife. He's 40 years old at this point, okay? And he says, but it can't be among the Canaanites that we live in. We're nomads here. We're visitors. They don't believe in God. They're pagans. So I need you to go back to my homeland of Ur, and I need you to find a God-fearing wife for my son Isaac. And you need to do it with a vow, okay? That's what he tells his servant. The servant said to him, perhaps the woman may not be willing to follow me to this land. From where they are to his homeland is 500 miles away, okay? That is you getting into a car, heading east, and getting to Tucson, Arizona, 500 miles, and then driving for another 40 miles, all right? That's how far it is. You can make that in six, seven hours in a car. You can make it maybe one hour in a plane. It's gonna take months on a camel, all right? It's a long trek. Must I then take your son back to the land? Should I take Isaac, right, if she won't come back? Abraham said to him, see to it that you do not take my son back here. We don't know why. It's really possible that Isaac was broken at the death of his mother too, and he was still grieving. And so he said, you need to do this, my most trusted worker. Abraham continues, the Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from my kindred and spoke to me and swore to me to your offspring, I will give this land. He will send his angel before you and you shall take a wife for my son from there. But if the woman's not willing to follow you, then you'll be free from this oath of mine. Not only you must not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. Okay, let's explain this, what's happening here. There's an oath that's being taken here. The oath is an Abrahamic Old Testament covenant. And when they say, put your hand under the thigh, they're being generous, okay? It's a handshake mixed with a cup check that two men did to each other back then, okay? Um, it is meant to be covenantal, okay? Listen, we're not doing that no more, all right? If we make a deal, shake my hand, okay? We don't need to do all that, but that's what was happening here. Genesis 24, 12. Okay, so, so, so the servant journeys for 500 miles back to the land of which Abraham came from. And when he gets there, he has 10 camels, he's got some servants with him, right? And he's got some riches with him. And his job is to find a wife for Isaac to be the mother of the nations. And he gets there. And he said, oh Lord, God of my master. The servant is praying at this point, oh Lord, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master Abraham. Behold, I'm standing by a spring of water and the daughters of the men are coming in the city to draw out water. Let the young woman to whom I shall say, please let down your water jar that I may drink and who shall say to me, drink, and I will water your camels. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master. The servant's got a big job. Find a spouse for Isaac. He gets to the city and he's like, I don't know what to do. Right? And so he sets this prayer before God, right? And so right here, I'm gonna give, I'm gonna switch the sermon a little bit because right here we have God's directions. How do you find a good wife? Okay, so if there's any unmarried men in here, how do you find a good wife? Here's the answers, okay? Proverbs 31.10 says, an excellent wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. And this is what you take away from it. It is hard to find a godly wife. So here's the first thing that the servant does when looking for a wife, praise to God. If you are a man looking for a godly wife, pray. 
Pray often, fast and pray, pray and pray, 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 all right? Pray in groups, okay? You need to seek God. And the second thing he did by saying, she will give me water and then water the camels is this. He was looking for specific qualities in the woman. First, he was saying she will love God because I'm going back to Abraham's land, okay, to look for her. She will love God so um, that she would be a God follower. Number two, with the watering of the 10 camels, it's this. She would prove to be considerate. She'd prove to be thoughtful. She'd prove to be caring. There's a reason he was looking for someone to water the camels because if you can water 10 camels, you can feed three or four kids, right? Right? It's gonna be easier. So men, if you are looking for a godly wife, this is how this translates to our society today. We have a lovely family in the church. They own a bowling alley across the way here called the Concourse. Men, if you're looking for a wife, you will go to the bowling alley. You will post up at the bar and you will say, the first woman who buys me a drink, that is to be my wife. Yeah. Actually, if she buys me a drink and then she buys drinks for your 10 buddies who smell like camels, right? Marry her, right? All right, so that's not gonna work, okay? That's not gonna work. So where does he find a spouse? Track me with this if you're looking for a wife. Where? Abraham sent his servant away. He was living in a land, Canaan. But he says, I need someone from my homeland, far away, 500 miles. There was something to the fact, if Canaan is the current world we live in, if Canaan is the culture that we live in, then anybody here who's looking for a spouse, men and women, you are going to have to go far from this culture and what this culture accepts to find a spouse. You're gonna to have to find a spouse from your father's land, amen? amen? Thank you, I felt good about that. <laughs> I did. So if Canaan represents the culture we live in now, this culture is materialistic, this culture promotes a hookup, promiscuous lifestyle. Men and women, you will not find the right spouse from this land. You'll have to travel and I'm not talking physically travel. I'm talking set standards and go further looking for someone who believes what you believe, has the same values that you have, someone who loves the Lord and you can be equally yoked with. You don't want a worldly spouse. You want a spouse from your father's land. So what happens here? He is sat there. Before he had finished speaking, behold, Rebecca who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with a water jar on her shoulder. So this is Abraham's niece. The young woman was very attractive in appearance. A maiden whom no man had known, she went down to the spring and filled her water jar up. Okay, so let's go. Looking for specific qualities, okay? Loves God. Considerate, right? Considerate, thoughtful. All right, let's go, let's go, let's go. Looking for specific, loves God. Considerate, thoughtful, caring. Willing to move out, because she's gonna have to 500 calories, 500 calories, 500 miles. And then, very attractive, okay? So, that's not the main thing, but it doesn't hurt, okay? So if she's, you know, smoking hot. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, please give me a little water to drink from your jar. First part of the test. She said, drink, my lord. And she quickly let the jar upon her and gave him a drink. When she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels also until they finished drinking. If this sounds weird to you, it's not for the land. This is a country girl who loves horses, sees that the horses are thirsty and says, I'm gonna get some water for the horses and she feeds them water as she pets their mane, okay? You guys can all imagine that. It's not that bizarre. She quickly emptied her jar into the trough, ran again to draw the well to water, and she drew for all his camels. Listen, if the well was up some steps and then she had to come back down, she did this 10 times to feed the camels. This is a thoughtful, considerate woman, right? The man gazed at her in silence to learn whether the Lord had prospered his journey or not. 
When the camels had finished drinking, the man took a gold ring weighing a half shekel and two bracelets for her arms weighing 10 gold shekels, four ounces, and said, please tell me whose daughter you are. Is there room in your father's house for us to spend a night? She said to him, I'm the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, whom she bore to Naor. She added, we have plenty of room. Straw and fodder, room to spend the night. The man bowed his head, the servant, and worshiped the Lord. Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his steadfast love for his faithfulness toward my master. As for me, the Lord has led me in the way to the master of my, uh, uh, sorry, to the house of my master's kinsmen. This is Abraham's own family. Then the young woman ran and told her mother's household about all these things. So she's been blessed. She runs home. She's got two bracelets. She's got a, a gold nose ring. It's, it's a lot of gold. And if you're a good father and your, your, your daughter comes home with all this jewelry, you're going to say what? Who gave that to you? Right? Because people don't give expensive things to other people without wanting something. Amen? Who is that? I need to know. Right? She says, there's this visitor, Abraham's servant. Right? And, 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 and he blessed me. And he's like, I know Abraham. So the father says to the servant, come in, verse 31. Oh, blessed of the Lord, why do you stand outside? I prepared the house and a place for the camels. He goes on and he says, there's a meal here. Come on in. Verse 23, the food was set before him to eat, but the servant said, I will not eat until I have said what I have to say. He's just like, I got to get this out. I got to know. Okay, are you the one? said, speak on. Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old, and to give him, uh, he has given all that he has. Sarah, rich, Isaac, rich, and then he goes on and tells about his mission. I was sent here. I was, Abraham said, get somebody from my homeland, right? He even talks about the covenant, right? Which is a weird thing to add there, but I guess, you know, whatever, right? 2449, now then, if you're going to show steadfast love and faithfulness to my master, tell me. And if not, tell me that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. Let me tell you guys something. It's the most romantic wedding proposal I've ever heard. Right? Did you guys catch it? That's what that was. Right? So, so he was trying to set up an arranged marriage. Okay? And he says, that's my mission here. And this is her father. Rebecca's father here says this. Verse 57, let us call the young woman and ask her. And they called Rebecca, said to her, will you go away with this man? She said, I will go. So they sent Rebecca, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant, and his men, and they blessed Rebecca and said to her, look at this prophetic blessing. Our sister, may you become thousands of ten thousands. May your offspring possess the gate of those who hate him. Then Rebekah and her young woman rose and rode on the camels and followed the man. Thus the servant took Rebekah and went his way. It worked. Now they have to travel 500 miles back to Canaan. Genesis 24, 62. Now Isaac had returned from Beer Lahai Roy and was dwelling in the Negev. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field toward the evening. Isaac is out praying. Right? He is out meditating. He's praying. And behold, and he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, they were camels coming. Rebecca lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camels, and she said to her servant, who is that man walking in the field to meet us? Um, more specifically in the Hebrew, she said, who's that? <laughs> I translated that. The servant said, it's my master. So she took her veil, covered herself, and the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. He breaks it down to Isaac. Then Isaac brought her, Rebekah, into the tent of Sarah, his mother, and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. See how that came full circle? And they all lived happily ever after. Why was it so important for Abraham to find a wife for his son? It wasn't just so that the, the nation's thing could continue. It was this. Abraham was grieving. 
He was hurting. His heart was pierced. He was broken. But he knew that he was only broken because he'd enjoyed such wonderful years with Sarah. And he said, Isaac, I pray that you can love someone so much that you can have the same amount of grief that I have when they pass. And he found a wife. And he found a wife. And he said, Mom, we're we're even in your tent. And he loved her. And that comforted him in his grief. What do you do when a loved one dies? You continue the plan. If God is gracious, you'll finish the race. You'll finish your plan. Something that would have made your spouse or your parent proud. You weren't here to see this, hon. You weren't here to see this, dear. You weren't here to see this, mom. But we did it. We made it to the end. Mission accomplished. What do you do when a loved one dies? You let grief take its course. It's okay to hurt. It's okay to feel pain. You're not weak if you feel pain. It's natural. And when a loved one dies, you continue in the plan. You honor them when you do so. And when you do that, you experience the grace of our living God. Pray with me. Father God, I lift up anybody in here who is grieving who is maybe denied or tried to stop the, uh, the steps of grief because they didn't want to feel weak or whatever reason. God, I pray that you would allow them, invite them the freedom to just grieve. Grieve the loss of a loved one. For anybody in here who is at a place now where they haven't continued, they're stuck, God, I pray that your spirit would allow them to continue the plan, to finish what was started, Lord. And as always, I pray that your Holy Spirit would continue to comfort all of us who mourn and grieve. In Jesus' name, amen.